Okay, very exciting. So welcome everyone um, to another educational and inspiring AAM workshop, Filmmaking as Activism. This workshop covers what is involved in an animal rights documentary, what to do and what to avoid and what the future looks like for effective animal rights films. Sean Monson and Bobby Sud will share their personal experiences with filming, producing and directing AR films. And my name is Michelle Granberg. I'm your moderator. I'm a mentor and team member with Animal Activism Mentorship. I'm located in New Jersey, and I've been a vegan and activist for almost six years. AAM's mission is to eradicate violence and build a culture of empathy and compassion, which ultimately results in animal liberation. We strive to build a global community of activists through our free online program that pairs experienced activists with aspiring activists. Through one-on-one -on -one mentoring, we strive to generate an increased number of effective activists worldwide because we know this movement needs more activists. Additionally, we offer free workshops that train and educate our mentors, mentees, and the public on various aspects of animal rights activism. We have a podcast called the Animal Liberation Hour, and we host large-scale in-person activism events. So stay tuned to the, at the end, I will be making a few announcements. AM is also proud to be fueled by FARM, the Farmed Animal Rights Movement, one of the oldest AR organizations in the country. If you're interested in applying to become a mentor or mentee or to get more involved or to donate, please visit our website, www.animalactivismmentorship.com and follow both AM and FARM on social media. So that being said, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Bobby Sud is an animal rights activist, AAM mentor, and AR photographer. Guest speaker Sean Monson is a producer and director known for the documentaries, Dominion and Earthlings. We will be opening up the floor for questions after the presentation. So hold your questions until that time. And we welcome you to raise your hand at that point. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Bobby. Bobby, go ahead and take it now. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm Bobby Sud, and uh, I met uh, Sean, what, like six years ago? Um, it was his first pig vigil that I had gone to, and I was introduced to Sean by a mutual friend, JP, Jean-Pierre, who I feel like everyone in the world should know JP. JP. He's kind of like the most wonderful human being on the planet. Um, yeah, and like, and that night was, like that, that night changed the trajectory of my life. Uh, the only thing that changed it more was when my brother convinced me to adopt the plant-based diet and a vegan lifestyle, um, because that's, that's what got me there. But, um, you know, the vigils changed my life because that became a big part of my life. And then meeting Sean and Sean eventually asking if I would work with him on, on a project he was doing, which, uh, I mean, that blew me away. I never thought that would happen. Um, and I just wanna like, I wanna take a moment. Like I was, I've been very fortunate to have Sean Monson, not only as a mentor, but as a friend. Uh, there's a lot that goes into filming the suffering of animals, filming on a kill floor, filming in a factory farm where they're culling animals. And, and I wouldn't have been able to handle it as well without him. And I think I've ever formally thanked you for that. So I just want to say thank you, Sean. Uh, and, you know, over the last what, five years, there's been, Sean and I have talked a lot about where animal rights filmmaking was, where it's going, like how, how can we be more effective? What's the new effective way of doing things? And, you know, in my opinion, I think Earthlings is the most important animal rights film of the century, if not ever. Uh, and because of that, films after it took that model. They, 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 there's been so many films like it. And like when I was in film school at the time when Earthlings came out and I wasn't vegan and I watched it because, I mean, out of, like we all heard about it. Like this, we heard about this torture fest of a film that like we watched out of like morbid curiosity to see if we could handle it. You know, and of course it affected us and it changed us. And I switched to environmental filmmaking after watching it. 
Um, but I think now things are different because people know what to expect. And then they didn't. Like we had no idea what we were gonna see when we watched that film. Now non-vegans kind of know what they're gonna see if they were to go and watch Dominion or something. They don't re- like, they don't have an entire understanding of it, but they, they kind of know. And I think that that's, that's something that we have to look at in terms of making things more effective. And, and, be, and like, what's the new model in terms of, because our audience isn't, shouldn't be vegans, our audience should be non-vegans. And Sean told me once, you know, Sean knows a lot of really cool people. And he was saying, he was talking to James Cameron and James Cameron said, you need to make a film that people want to watch, you know? And how, how do we do that as animal rights filmmakers? Uh, and I think that, you know, Sean isn't, people think Sean is special because he's been inside slaughterhouses and he's seen all this suffering and, you know, here he is and he's, you know, perfectly sane still. Uh, but what makes Sean special isn't that, that like we need to get rid of that idea of giving someone a badge because they've seen more suffering than someone else. Like what makes Sean special is one, he's highly intelligent and he has laser focus. Like he's always thinking about how, how can we do this? How can we do this? How can we make better change? How can we do things better? And instead of just like, let's just go do something. He's like, no, how do we go do something the best way possible? And so I thought I would just ask Sean some questions about that to get us started. And then afterwards, he'll, we'll have a longer Q and A session afterwards. If that's cool with everybody. Yeah. Sean, you, you, are you? Yeah. I mean, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the introduction. And yeah. um, um, it's true uh, that uh, I try to put as much uh, thought into um, each project. It's one of the reasons there's big gaps in between films. Um, and you said something earlier, Bobby, that was interesting about how we could approach this issue. And I think each person here listening it's like you're all musicians and you all like a certain kind of music. And I may not, let's say I don't like um, um, opera and someone here writes and sings opera or country or something else, but, but because each person has their own unique voice, uh, it's really important that you do express your own voice. Um, because there's no other filmmaker like you. Um, I can't make a film you're going to make. And um, only you have that voice. And you're not, you may not be sure how many people that could have a positive effect on until you do it. So you don't have to make your stuff look like maybe other people's stuff. You, of course, you're welcome to. Um, but uh, I'm a big proponent for following your inspiration, wherever that wherever inspiration comes from, because it's so unique. Um, and I want to see other people's, the other people's work. I want to see their compositions and how they put it together. And I'm just one of, uh, one of others because uh, hopefully one of those compositions will have a positive effect on uh, whoever comes across it. So anyway, um, thanks for the introduction, Bobby. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know if you remember, we were on a plane, I think we were going to Arkansas, we were going to film somewhere. And uh, this was like one of the first, you know, like the early days of me getting to work with you. And I asked you, what made you make Earthlings? Like, uh, and I thought your intro was very interesting. I don't know if you'd like to talk about that. Like, sure. What inspired you to make it? And then where did, how did you get started? Well, the, um, and maybe some of you heard this before, so it, it may have been covered, but, um, uh, one of the earliest, there was a couple, it's a, usually a convergence of things will happen. And I think that's true of, uh, uh, of any, not just film or, 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 or music or sort of artistic endeavor, if you will, but even an innovation, even a technological innovation or a market innovation, it's usually a convergence of things that will happen. Um, so on the one hand, I was having dreams and the animals were coming to me in the dreams and they were saying, you've got to tell our story. Um, added to that, I was 
um, all through my 20s, I was working on low budget films. I was just cutting my teeth as it were. And I was a, a grip and then I was a boom operator and I was a, a truck driver or an electrician. And I was trying to find jobs on low budget films where I could learn, but not too much hard work. I wanted, I wanted to be able to observe the director and observe the actors and see how they were putting stuff together. I was a boom operator for many years and I thought that was a really good position. A boom operator, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure you all do, but it's who records the sound on the sets. And uh, the boom operator seemed to be a person who, even on a closed set, would be permitted to be there to listen to the director talk to the actors to listen to the cinematographer to overhear what the producers were saying so i moved into i was a boom operator for many years but i was a boom operator in all these very low budget movies <laughs> and i think i learned more of what i was not going to do in my career than anything that i was going to do because it was just such crap stuff that we were working on i i was dying to learn something great but i didn't get to work for like a spielberg or a nolan or anybody cool i just did all these low budget crappy movies but I learned a lot of what not to do. Anyway, um, so that chewed up a lot of my 20s and I was getting pushing 30 and I had to direct a film before I turned 30. It was one of those goals. And then these dreams were coming and um, I did a public service announcement for spaying and neutering pets. We shot it in downtown LA. Uh, this was probably 1999. And um, um, I got permission from animal control, Los Angeles animal control officers, we call them ACOs, animal control officers, to go on a ride along. And I brought two cameras with me. I brought a, a, a video camera, an XL1, which was a really cool camera at the time. And I also brought um, a Bull U, a super eight millimeter film, because I wanted to have these two different film stocks. So I had this old eight millimeter Bull U camera. And there was a place in Burbank called Pro 8 Sound where you could go get 35 millimeter film stock cut to eight millimeter and shoot these three minute spools. And so I had these two cameras in my lap and I went um, on a ride along. I did one in Los Angeles, uh, downtown LA and I did one in Long Beach. And I uh, spent the day with uh, two different ACOs in each city. And uh, um, one, of the, one of the places we went back and they, we were, I was filming euthanasia, you know, dogs, because they euthanize dogs in all these cities. We euthanize about, the statistics change, we euthanize about 30,000 dogs and cats a day in this country. So if you were to stack 30,000 dogs, it's about three floors. So it's, a, it's quite a large number and 50% of the animals in shelters are purebreds nowadays. So, um, so I was filming euthanasia and after they would take the, the bodies and they put them in this large refrigerated room because on Thursdays, the a rendering truck would come and pick up all the, the dead and take them off to, to the rendering plant. And um, this, would all, this room would also have a uh, road, you know, road kill that they would pick up. And, uh, but it was mostly dogs and cats, but it was something about seeing dogs and cats in a refrigerator. It was like a walk-in refrigerator room like you might see at a restaurant. But it was something about seeing them in a refrigerator. And uh, it made me think of meat. It made me think of meat, even though I was looking at dogs and cats. And uh, so between the dreams and this goal to make a film before I turned 30 and this public service announcement I was doing, which was just on spaying and neutering, just a, a little PSA on spaying and neutering pets. I went home one night and I remember thinking, and this is probably what Bobby and I were chatting about maybe. Um, I just began to correlate, I just began to correlate and that was the genesis of Earthlings, which is Earthlings is in five chapters. So it's pets, food, clothing, entertainment, medical research, scientific research. So, and I remember um, just seeing all how all these things were connected, not just dogs and cats at home, but how we ate and what we wore, where our entertainment came from, all these products that we buy to keep ourselves beautiful or healthy. And I remember laying in bed and I went to this little apartment in Burbank. I lived, I, I lived practically right across the street from Warner Brothers at the time. And, I remember thinking someone should just, someone needs to put all this together, like, um, like the encyclopedia, like of how we treat animals. So someone should just put it all, because I was just doing the PSA on spaying and neutering pets. And then it just hit me, it just hit me with the, from the dreams and this goal to make a film before I turned 30. And I just thought, 
oh man, I think it's me. Like, I think I have to do this. I think I'm the one that has to put it together. And I had no, hadn't made a film before. Um, and this is the point that I would share with all of you listening, you know, um, yes, on the one hand, studying the art of filmmaking and technique and so forth is, is invaluable. But in the same breath, you should really just listen to that inner voice and see what, see what comes. Because when you go out and shoot with docs, it's hardly scripted anyway. You know, you're lucky to get what you get when you get it. A lot of it is really in the, in the editing. You know, it's in the editing. Like we always say, a film is born three times. It's born once in the writing, once in the shooting, and once in the cutting. And so I'm pretty relaxed now in the writing stage. We do a lot of writing for stuff, but um, including docs, like the narrative. But I'm not too cooped up about the writing because I know when I shoot, I'll probably get something else or it'll just kind of, it's a ballpark. And I'm not too worried about what I'm shooting because I know I, when I'm going to cut it, I'm going to kind of bring it together. So this sort of organic letting go of just documenting, just documenting what's happening. Just, just make sure you're in focus, your sound is good, your equipment's working. You don't have to give a running commentary the whole time. We all have become broadcasters since uh, social media started where we all feel like we have to give sort of a play-by-play -play about everything, but you should just, well, I don't mean to say should anybody, but you might consider just being quiet, letting the camera record. And um, so anyway, Bobby, I, I don't know if that's close to what we talked about, but that's my memory of the beginning of, of Earthlight. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's exactly what you said. I, I remember finding that so inspiring and then saying god why haven't <laughs> why haven't you know why hasn't this moment happened to me yet you know um and yeah. it's interesting when i was in when i went to when i was first in college i, was, I started in 2001 2002 and we were still shooting film and then video came and i got an xl1s and i felt like the shit on campus man yeah. I was, you know, it's pretty cool at the time yeah, yeah. it was pretty cool yeah, it's pretty cool lightweight mini dv uh, yeah. anyway um, so, yeah, I also want to talk about Unity. I know mm -hmm. everyone knows about Earthlings and Dominion, but your second film, Unity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember talking to you about that. And um, the opening scene in, in Unity is really the, one of the hardest, if not the hardest scene in the movie mm -hmm. uh, with the, the cow trying to back out of that yeah. uh, shoot. That yeah. shoot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember you also telling me that there's more to that footage. Mm -hmm. um, you showed me some of it and that when you were editing and you were talking with distributors, they wanted you to take that out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you said something that to me, I thought was really profound. You, you, you told them like, listen, documentaries, we're working with truth. How much truth do you want me to take out for it to be okay with you? Precisely. Like, Precisely. how do you deal with, with, with things like, Distributors saying we'll distribute your film if, mm -hmm. you know, how, how, how have you how have you dealt with that in the past? Well, um, so their point was, and there's there's some there's some truth to this. It's worth considering when you think of the business of uh, the, the film business and and distribution. It's critically now, especially now. I think a lot about it with the projects that I have in development right now. But the thing is, they were concerned that the first five minutes of the movie or the first two minutes, people are going to look at it and say, oh, this is an animal rights film and they're going to turn it off before they ever give it a chance. So that was one component. They wanted people to give the movie more of a chance, give it at least 10 minutes, see if we can get them in for 10, 12. There's this sort of arbitrary window of 10 to 12 minutes. It's probably even shorter now. The, um, because Unity, Unity came out in 2015 and we were showing it to distributors in 2013 and 2014. We got a distribution deal in 2013. So two years before it came out, we had our deal. But uh, the, the attention spans are so short now. Even Netflix, you know, uh, it used to be they'll only read the first 10 pages of your script. Now they only watch the first 10 minutes of a film that's submitted. They don't watch the whole film. They'll only watch the first 10 minutes max because if they're not interested in 10 minutes, they know that the viewers aren't interested. Um, so, uh, so part of their question, that question had to do with getting the film seen. Um, but I felt it was a profound opening, uh, regardless if they felt it was an animal rights movie or not, that people would judge it. And I knew we had some pretty big names in the movie that might make people say, okay, I'm gonna give this a little more time. But the clincher was is that we had another scene in the film. I don't know if you ever saw this one, Bobby, because it was taken out pretty early. 
But we had a scene later in the film. Unity is a, a sequel to Earthlings. It also has five chapters. It's part of a trilogy. I haven't done the third one yet. And there's another reason for that. We could talk about some other time, but, um, but Unity is Cosmos, Mind, Body, Heart, and Soul. So these are the chapters, mind, body, heart, and soul. And then there's a cosmos chapter because the cosmos represents the, the environment, that the realm, this prodigious realm that all this is transpiring in. So it's a pretty philosophical film. And um, in the mind chapter, we cover war. We talk about war, man's propensity for war and how mankind has been at war for 95% of recorded civilization, which is quite a high number. 95% of recorded civilization, mankind has been at war. And why weren't we at war for that 5%? Um, did we have some epiphany of, uh, of higher consciousness or we were too sick or too poor or too destitute that we just could fight for about that 5% of history. And that's the only reason why we weren't killing each other. Um, anyway, it's in that mind chapter and the end of it that I had a, another scene that tagged the opening scene, sort of a bookend in the midpoint of the film. And we called it the death of birth sequence. And um, footage came from the slaughterhouse in Turkey. And I was um, astounded by this footage. I didn't shoot it, it was sent to me um, because it was one of the cleanest slaughterhouses I'd ever seen. It was white tile, white square tiles everywhere like you would see in a bathroom. Just like clinical, like a, like a doctor's, like, a, like an operating room of some kind. Extremely white and clean. It almost looked like a spaceship. And um, inside they brought in this cow, this dairy cow, cow, and she was hoisted up upside down and they cut her open. She's still a conscious, she's not dead yet. If, I don't know if they've stunned her. We didn't see the beginning of the clip, but she seems to be um, feeling this as they cut her open. And the men there are talking and conversing some are smoking while they're working. Um, and of course, this is so common that there's, it's, it's as if nothing unusual is happening because they do this all the time. But what was shocking about the footage is they're taking the guts of this animal out, this full grown calf just plops right out on the floor, fully grown and starts mooing, just laying there mooing. And the mother, who's had her insides taken out and her baby and his hump is kicking and trying to turn to get to her, her calf. And, um, and the men are looking at going, ah, you know, because pregnant cows get sent to slaughter all the time. There's different reasons for that too. It's because sometimes the farm where they're raising the cows tries to even rip off the slaughterhouse, you see, because they're two separate businesses. And it's not by head, it's by weight, it's by weight in the truck. So um, a cow that weighs more because she's pregnant doesn't count as food later. So sometimes they'll send pregnant cows off to slaughter because it weighs more in the truck. They also give them salt to lick before they get on the truck, which makes them extra thirsty. So they drink more water so the truck weighs more because there's more water weight, which they then urinate. So this is how the farm where the cows are coming from is trying to even make a couple extra buck off the, bucks off the packing house. You know. Anyway, this calf is on the ground in this pristine white 2001 a space odyssey looking slaughterhouse and of course when they cut her open this the blood just goes all over this white white wall and she's trying to get to her baby and the um and to the men this has probably happened maybe this happens every day anyway they reach down with a knife and they slit the baby calf's throat and they kill her and they throw her down this hole and um they called the scene the death of birth and um my distributor said to me, because he knew I wanted the opening shot, he said, you can have one, but you can't have both. You can't have both, so pick one. And this is to Bobby's point about the nonfiction film, the true film and how much truth you take out of it so that maybe people will watch it because you got to have an audience. James Cameron's right. You got to make a film people want to see. None of us can afford to make a film that people don't see. There's just no point to it. So um, 
I opted to keep the opening sequence and I took out the death of birth scene. So there's a little backstory on that for you, Bobby, if you hadn't heard that before. Yeah, I had, and you'd shown it. I'd seen the footage. Oh, there, there was okay. a time where, like, you were sending me, "Hey, look at this." Yeah, I yeah. get a text from Sean, I'd be like, "Oh God." Yeah, <laughs> I, I know. I used to tell that. I used to say to Joaquin, I said, um, I, "He and I have known each other for about twenty years, and um, and we've worked together quite a bit." I've said, I said to him, um, "I said, dude, because we're, we're we're friendly, you know." I said, "Dude, I'm so sorry that every time I call, it's." probably awful but uh please you know just it, it helps when you're attached and you lend your voice to it or your face to it so please don't avoid my emails or texts because every time it's just so god awful um in the last few years we've changed that a little bit but but yeah bobby sometimes it's just uh see, the truth is very hard to take so um you know i'm not a a, a religious person but they um there's some theologians who believe that um for what this is worth some of you might find this interesting is that but the ten commandments that came down from mount sinai weren't the original ten commandments there were ten other commandments might be in josephus i forget where i read this somewhere um or philo or one of these old texts but uh, but when moses came down as it's written as it's written for what this is worth and saw that the uh, the Hebrews were worshiping a golden calf. Um, he threw those commandments down and they were shattered and destroyed because he believed that they were too, too advanced. These 10, whatever they were, were too advanced. So the 10 commandments that were done then were much more simplified. Don't steal, <laughs> don't kill, <laughs> don't covet. And what I find interesting about that is here we are I don't know, 5,000 years later, whatever it is. And we're still having a hard time with those basic, basic, basic fundamentals. So maybe there's some truth to, uh, to too much truth. And so we take a little bit out to try to get the message seen. I wrestle with that still. That's a tough one. Because the animal, of course, is suffering and it's absolute. It's this supreme moment that we're documenting. We're recording the moment of death. We're capturing the moment of death. And they deserve to have their um, these beautiful, graceful, incredible individual beings. It seems that they should have this moment. But um, but you guys, if if people aren't going to watch this stuff, we have to be smart. We have to be smart. I just did a little piece for a friend. I just something I edited for her. She's in Florida. She's been an activist for forty years. Sweet, wonderful unsung hero and i helped her with this piece and the reason i did it was because again she was just this unsung hero this wonderful woman uh, her name was susan but um she kept footage of all her activism for um almost 40 years she kept newspaper clippings she kept video from protests at sea world in the 90s she just had to just kept a little bit of a library my reason i mentioned this is because she showed footage of a protest at sea world or it may have been the Miami Seaquarium where Lolita is, this beautiful orca Lolita that some of you may know about. And they were saying, the activists were there and they were saying, um, they were shouting animal liberation, when do we want it now, animal, the typical stuff. And I'm watching this and I'm thinking, are we saying the same stuff like 37 years later, like the same stuff? You know, you go to buy a car, you go to Toyota and you buy a Prius. You're going to get an email survey right after. They're going to ask you about your sales experience. Why are they doing that? Because they want to improve their business. They want to know if this worked, if this didn't work, if this happened. That's, that's why they do it. We as a movement, I don't think we do that. We're not checking ourselves. Is this working? If it's not working, we're smart people. Let's just sit back and think tank this for a minute. Really take a moment and consider it. That's okay. I'm not judging the activists for that. Sometimes we're doing all that we can do. We don't have any money. We can make a sign. We can stand on the sidewalk. You know, And maybe that's all we can do. 
But 37 years later, if we're saying the same stuff, it's, if it's maybe not working, it's an opportunity to dig deeper and see if there's something else we could do that might be more effective. Anyway, Bobby, I tend to drift, uh, swerve around the road when you ask me questions, no, but no. hopefully that, that answers it. No, I'm, I'm glad you, you talked about that. That's something important to me as well. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about, like we've, we've talked recently about, I guess, what we call like Trojan horse yeah. filmmaking. Yes. And I think we both agree that that's the next step in effective animal rights filmmaking. 100%, you know, in um, my opinion, in my opinion. You know, uh, an obvious example of that is something like Okja. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, don't look do, up. Might don't look up. <laughs> yeah. How do we get... One, that's, it's, it's a lot easier to make a documentary than it is to make oak Joe sure. and don't look yeah. up. Mm -hmm. So how do, like, what do you think we need to do to transition, or if we should, into a different style of filmmaking that maybe isn't as simple as just going out and making a documentary? Well, um, again, it just requires a little bit of more uh, pondering, ruminating on this for a moment, really sort of meditate on it, perhaps. Um, because um, if you don't think that there's a kid out there who's going to shoot some awesome movie on his iPad and it's going to be a hit, you're crazy because it's going to happen. Someone will make a film on an iPad or a phone that will just be completely astonishing. It will happen. In fact, um, years ago, I did a, bio a biography on, this is unrelated to animal rights, I did a piece on Orson Welles. It was a project I was doing. So this great filmmaker, Orson Welles. <laughs> He used to go to bullfights, by the way, and I wasn't too impressed by that, but this is from a different time. But in the end of his life, he actually admitted he regretted all that, but he'd seen too much blood. So he's had some sort of awareness come to him about bullfighting, but anyway. Um, and he used to say, when he made Citizen Kane, his cinematographer was a guy named Greg Toland, who was a, an Academy Award-winning cinematographer. I believe he'd shot The Grapes of Wrath. Um, and here came this new upstart young filmmaker, Orson Welles, who, been on radio because he was a very young man who had this deep, deep baritone voice. Just one of those guys that as a kid had just an incredible voice. he lost his mother. He lost his father later. He had a brother, Richard, who he drifted. And so Orson was kind of alone from the age of 15 on. And he went into, uh, he went to Ireland and he got into theater there and he came back and he was doing plays as a very young man on radio. He got into radio. He was the youngest man at the time to ever be on the front of Time magazine. And he was the voice of uh, the March of Time, which was the CNN of the day. He was the voice of a program called The Shadow. Who knows what eagle, evil lurks in the hearts of men? The Shadow knows. This is all Orson at a very young age. And, and one night he decided to, on his little radio show, do H.G. Uh, Wells' War of the Worlds. But he said it in New Jersey. And, um, and everybody listening and, uh, thought it was really happening because he made it all sound real and he freaked people out. And from this, uh, RKO Pictures, which is now Paramount, at the time, Paramount said, who is this guy? Who was this glib 23-year-old kid who just put the world on fire? And they gave him what's the most coveted four-week contract in the history of Hollywood, which is writer, producer, director, actor. And he'd never made a film before. And his first movie of all films was Citizen King. Anyway, there's a little backstory for Orson. Now, Orson used to ask Greg Tolan. And cameras were the size of refrigerators back then, these giant cameras. Orson wanted to put the camera wherever he wanted. And he said, Greg, wh why, does the, why does my camera have to be attached to my lens? Why can't I just put my lens wherever I want to put it? And this is a guy, this is in the 30s. Now, you guys, this is the freaking iPhone, right? This is the iPhone 13. Maybe some of you have that one too. Did, 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 did you know that... Uh, Years ago, Tom Cruise and um, um, Jamie Foxx did a film called Collateral. You might remember this movie called Collateral. It was about a hitman. The chip in this iPhone is better than the camera that shot that Tom Cruise movie, Collateral. That's how good the iPhone is. We were at a BAFTA event at the British Academy, and uh, Ridley Scott was there, Ridley Scott. And he said, you have no excuse. Kind of like Orson. You have no excuse. You have a film camera in your pocket that rivals stuff that any of the great filmmakers had in the past. You have distribution now. You have editing equipment built into your 
laptops and you have free distribution. He says, yeah, you have no excuse. You have no excuse. So Bobby, to answer your question about Trojan horse filmmaking, which we can talk to you a little, a little more length, but we just have to think of a concept that is appealing, is appealing to people that is commercial. It's interesting, but we have to think of it on a scale that is doable financially with whatever means we have. And if we just take a moment or a week or a month or six months to just think about it and ponder it and search for that, it'll come to us and you can make a movie. Anybody can make a movie today. Back when I did Earth Things, which came out in 2005, I finished, finished it in 2004, it took a year to get it out. Um, it was still kind of novel that someone could, oh, you made a movie. Well, you know, but today, you know, pretty much on social media, people are making short and featuring stuff. They're just making it all the time. So I would just ask people to really think about what you want to say that your inspiration speaks to you, but in a way that as many people as possible want to listen. The story that Bobby's telling you about James Cameron was we were at, um, the, I'm in Los Angeles. We're at a restaurant called Crossroads and, and uh, they were launching the Impossible Burger. It was a private event and there was just some people there to taste this new impossible burger and we were there and uh, and James Cameron was there and I was wearing a t-shirt at the time that said eat what elephants eat on it and uh, he was sitting with his wife I didn't see him at first but this gray-haired man walked up and approached me and says hey I like your shirt and I turned and it was James Cameron so we start chatting for about 15 or 20 minutes um, and my partner Amy's there and she said um well, this is Sean. He did a doc. He's a documentary. He did a film called Earthlings. And Jim goes, I saw Earthlings. And I said, you saw Earthlings? He goes, oh, yeah. And I said, all the way through? And he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, let me tell you. And he, he um, literally puts his arm around me. And I'm thinking, I'm about to hear, like, the golden secret of Hollywood. Like, this is the key. And whatever that key is, I'm going to use it for an animal message. That's what I'm going to do. Let's hear it. And he says what Bobby said earlier. He goes, Whenever I do a movie, I do two things. First, I make a movie people want to see. And second, I put a message in it. And then he pays me a pretty high compliment. He says, um, he says, he says, Sean, your movie has one of the best messages I've ever seen in a film. And then he leans in close and he goes, and nobody wants to see it. And we laughed because it's true. It's true. Um, so since then and since unity and dominion and some other stuff the last six years i've been developing fully forming ideas that i think can reach a much broader audience bring them in and act one definitely hold them in act two and in act three smack them outside the head just like they saw doc that was the idea of the trojan horse and maybe that way more people will see it because even with the success of earthlings it came slowly over many, many, many years. And we don't really have time um, for films to be discovered slowly by people we need to. So that's my message to people is really think about what your inspiration is saying to you and find a way to do it that a lot of people might want to take a look at it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, like I've done workshops on like effective activism or what I think is effective activism, you know. Nobody's got nobody's got it figured out because if they did, we wouldn't need it, right? Right. Uh, but I, I think that goes to I think there's two ways, two main ways of doing it. You can make you can ha have someone listen to you while you prove that you're right, or you can actually get someone to listen to you. Yeah. And usually they're mutually exclusive, which is unfortunate, but that's usually the case because people's egos get in the way and things like that. Right. And I, I think that that's similar. To, I think that's a similar approach we should take to animal rights filmmaking let's make something that people will listen to that people will watch you know proving you're right mm -hmm. so what you prove yourself that to yourself that you're right because usually people don't want to hear that you know yeah i think everybody i can't talk too much about this here because i'll get i, I can't do it yet but um i've got two projects i've got three actually but two that are going to both go this fall and um one of them i think a lot of people are going to be really surprised by bobby knows a little bit about it but um because it's so opposite of anything I've done before. It's, it's a comedy. It's not a documentary. It's a romantic comedy. And um, it's, it's, uh, it appeals to people on a very 
basic level. It's like, it's like if I'm going to make my own version of Baywatch, okay, let's just say I'm going to make Baywatch and you're going, oh, you're going to go from Earth and from Unity to Baywatch. This is interesting. Let's see, let's see why he's doing this. But the setup is ultimately the same. It's animals, health, environment, ethics, but it's wrapped in a completely different package. And it's extremely clickable. Like if this thumbnail comes up on a plane, you're gonna press on it and you're gonna watch it. And when we're done with this and we release it, even then I'm gonna see, ah, oh, did this work? Did this work as much as I hope it could work? Like Bobby and I were just chatting at a farmer's market, I think a week ago about a movie I did. He's been, he's been cooking up and, and I, told, I told him, I said, there's two things that you have to do. You gotta go make the movie because the two things I'm going to tell you only happen after you've made the movie. You cannot have this happen to you before. It's not possible. Number one, the lesson you'll learn from it only comes to you after you did it. Otherwise, it's all theory and a concept. And we're not interested in concepts. We don't want to get bogged down in concepts. So you have to make the picture, assemble it, and release it. And watch it and be like, oh, okay, now I know. Next time I'll do this. Next time I'm going to do that. You can only see it after the fact. Number one. Number two, you don't really know what people will think until they see it. And then you're going to learn from that. Just like that Toyota survey. You're going to be like, so I tell people, get, think of what you're going to do. But make it. Don't dilly-dally. Get it done and get it out. Get it to market as quickly as possible because those are two invaluable lessons that you can only learn after the fact. So that's why I told Bobby to get going on his movie because, uh, because he has a lot to learn that will only happen when he's done, just like I will on my next one, like this one I'm talking about. It. I won't know until I finish. Did that idea work? But the attempt behind it was to broaden the reach because with docs, the first of all, there's lots of them. Secondly, people know it's instructive. Uh, third, docs are what I call a one and done. How many times has any of us really rewatched the same doc? There might be some exceptions, but for the most part, very few people rewatch docs. But you might rewatch the Avengers, or you might rewatch, you know, uh, uh, Doctor Shivago or Lawrence Arabia. For some reason, we watch those kind of narrative stories more than we rewatch documentaries. So one and done. Hmm. I mean, this this Top Gun craze right now because this new the sequel just came out, and what's great to see about about this and use it as a, a springboard for what the messaging we wanna do is, what kind of story can you tell that as soon as it's done, you almost wanna watch it again? That's what people said about the first one 30 some years ago. I saw Top Gun, the first thing I know is when it was over, I wanted to watch it again. No one ever watched Earth and said, I wanna watch it again right now, it just doesn't happen. So the information has one chance to get in based on our genre based on the format we're choosing. If it's a bunch of statistics and stack, uh, stats, which are interesting in books and interesting in, to read, but don't always transcend well to film. And I've done this before, I've used stats. Unity has several times where stats roll up. It doesn't seem to have the same impact in that medium as it does on a book. So we modify, we just have to modify. And this all goes back to development, that think tank. Uh, session that I mentioned that we could have with your ideas. We want people to want to watch our stuff and we'd love to have them watch it more than once because if it takes seven times for a message to get through to people, which is how advertisers do it, what are we doing with our one shot, hardcore, violent, screaming, bloody murder type, type, type things, you know, animal rights, when do we want it now for, for almost 40 years? I just ask activists to consider what I'm saying and think about this and dig a little deeper and see what comes yeah, we yeah. need the uh the star wars version of the animal rights film first ability that's always relevant even 50 years from now yeah, absolutely absolutely right i mean uh, listen i've got a 10 year old nephew loves the 1977 version of star wars and this kid was born in 2009 or 2010 this movie how many other movies from the 70s will a 10 year old watch Something about that that particular movie, and um, yeah, some of it has to do with what Joseph Campbell talks about, the great mythology professor, these innate stories that are, and these archetypes that are deep within our psyches. These are things worth studying. 
and yeah. modifying into the message we're trying to do for the animal, for the environment. Uh, do we want? I think we should go to a Q and A because I'm, I'm. I would think that I think people are going to have questions for Sean. Uh, Let's do it. Let's do it. Bobby, did you have some photos you had wanted to show, or are you going to wait till later? Oh, I don't. Yeah. I, well, I mean, we, we can show. I don't know if you wanted to show like um, the stuff we shot in Arkansas. You know, the the clip we did for the fundraiser. I don't know. Oh. No, let's, I, I'm, I'm inclined to skip it, but that's me. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, let's, uh, let's hear if they have questions, if, if they have any at all. If they want to go home, we can wrap it up too. <laughs> no way, you're not getting off that easy. Okay. Stay right where you are. All right, okay. folks. Well, let's open it up to questions for Sean and Sean and Bobby about anything at all. Um, oh, for Sean, in terms I don't think of... anyone have a question for me. <laughs> Somebody get to have a question for Bobby, please. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's really, I get it. <laughs> That's right. We have no egos here. There's this is an ego want, free like, zone. Just like have people like put up their hands or how do you want to do it? Oh yes, please. You know, um, I already see there's a question in the chat, so I'll read yeah. that, but it's okay. going to be just first come first serve. So Uday, you'll be next. Let me just read the question in the chat and folks, you know, go ahead and hit that hand raise icon. Uh, so from Dorothy Peterson, um, it seems animal rights films, books, et cetera, appeal to animal rights activists rather than reach people who are not involved in the AR movement. Are you suggesting that your Baywatch movie might be a way to reach that audience that won't watch an AR movie? Yeah. So um, this is something that I've been exploring, as I mentioned earlier, since Unity came out for about the last six years has been... Um, and that meeting with James Cameron had a profound effect on me. I was like, okay. Cameron said that when he came up with Avatar, because Cameron's a heavy environmentalist, he's really big into the environment. He's vegan. He started a school here in Malibu called uh, Muse, which is a vegan school and, um, and teaches kids about gardening. It's pretty cool. Um, he said he could tell any story he wants in the Avatar world. He felt that he could convey what he wanted to convey through Avatar. So he said, I am in the Avatar business now. I'm just doing that. And um, the idea is five of them, you know. So the next one comes out this Christmas. He's already shot two and three. I know because my producer on one of my projects was an AD on Avatar two and three. Um, and he's going to do, if they do well, he'll do four and five. Um, he feels that he can convey his messages to a huge audience uh, through that medium. Uh, my Baywatch idea is one of three I'm developing. I wanted to try comedy. I wanted to try something that's fantasy based and I wanted to try something that's dramatic drama. So I'm attempting three different genres with it. And like I said earlier to Bobby, I'm looking forward to seeing after and seeing, oh, did this work? Did it not work? And growing from there. In answer to that question, you can ask the second one now if you'd like. Yeah, there was a second question with that, which is, um, I don't know how to make a film, getting it out, get it out to you people or anything about filmmaking is your message that I buy an iPhone and post videos on YouTube and that will help the cause. Well, really my message is whatever speaks to you about the mistreatment of animals, whatever speaks to your heart about that, whether it's music, whether it's starting an organization, whether it's developing a new vegan burger, um, whether it's writing poetry, that's that's how you would help the cause because that's you, that's entirely your voice, uh, Dorothy. If this is a question from you, um, so I would like to hear your voice in whatever form that takes. It doesn't have to be a film. All right, so we have more questions coming in. So Maya is going to unmute and ask her question. And let me just say that Maya just did a workshop with us here on AAM, and she is an author of vegan fiction and she did a workshop on writing as activism which was amazing so folks can check that out on our youtube channel but go ahead maya and ask your question there's the book she wrote a trilogy by the way of vegan fiction nice, nice. <laughs> i know right i'm ashamed and ashamedly promoting them here but um to be honest um these are my Trojan books. Uh, we're talking about Trojans uh, because they are vegan fiction and they are intended for pre-vegan audience and they're actually uh, read by pre-vegan. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, as an indie writer uh, from New Zealand and um, you know, not 
close to Hollywood or anything like that. I actually wrote a script as well, and it did pretty well so far based on the shade. It got um, semi semi finalists, um, Santa Barbara, whatever. And um, so <laughs> the the appetite for for Trojan fiction films based on fiction books. I would really like to hear what you think and what you might be your guidance for my next move, because I would really like to push um, both my books and a potential movie based uh, on the books. They're kind of dystopian fantasy um, thrillers. And um, they are the first book like The Shade is very focused on Deary. Um, mm -hmm. So I would love to send to send them to you, by the way, but we can talk oh. about it some other time, okay. maybe. But uh, yeah, what what would you be your recommendation? What could be my next move? So I should stop playing with my hands. Um, mm. To for uh, potentially push push forward for someone with no connection with the industry whatsoever. Thank you, and by the way, thank you both. Bobby, you too. I love your humility, but your images that you take and some of the images that you took of the pigs are, are phenomenal. So thank you both. Yeah. Um, well, um, that's a good question. Um, you've already done so much by writing this trilogy, if it's three books or maybe if you've written more. Um, I always say the squeaky wheel gets the grease, you know, so uh, push it, keep pushing. My, my advice with pushing something is to push just shy of being annoying. You don't be pushing too much where it's sort of creepy or weird, but you got to push because um, a lot of other people are pushing. And look how much crap gets made and published. So you can't think that they, you know, as Tony Robbins says, there's no, um, <laughs> it's a bit crass, but Tony Robbins says, um, there's no special sperm club. In other words, um, you know, uh, someone coming in from the very, very inception of life doesn't sort of um, kissed by the Buddha or is granted something. Everybody hustles for it and gets it. And if some crap can get made, some real garbage can get made, what did they do? they catch some lucky break and they're born under a certain star. I don't think so. They just probably were really, really hustled and pushed it. So since you already have material, um, I would certainly push it more and more. Number one, number two, if you can afford to, or find a way, shoot a 60 second little teaser for your first book, find some way to create something that's video. In other words, something they can watch instead of read. It just gets their interest and keep it short, keep it really short and say, this is a teaser for a, a book I've written. It's part one of a trilogy. And I think they're all very cinematic and you take a look and you might get someone to say, well, this is, this is very interesting. And hopefully that doesn't cost uh, too much money. You can find a way to do it. Shoot it on your phone. Yeah, shoot it on your phone. I already have a um, preview for my books. See, a one minute preview. You're way <laughs> it's on my me. website. Oh, great. Great. Yeah, just yeah, keep hustling. I mean, if I if I get told no all the time, I get told no nine times out of ten for things that I'm pitching and trying. I once went to the DJ, that's Directors Guild of America, to hear uh, Martin Scorsese speak. I was just in a crowd with a bunch of people, and he's sitting up there and he says he gets told no all the time. And I thought, I thought, holy cow, man! If this guy's getting told no, we're I'm screwed. I'm I'm out. I, this is, I'm screwed. You know? But um, something to be said for uh, for hustling, you know, you're really just being tenacious and keep going. So the fact that you have material already, you're, you're way ahead. You're way ahead. Keep going with it. Great. I love seeing the two of you chat. It's wonderful. Maya, go ahead and put your website in the chat if you'd like and the link to the promo that you were just talking about as well. I'm gonna to go to a question, Tamir's question in the chat and then Priya, I'm gonna to come to you next. So Tamir was asking um, a, a fundamental basic question. Uh, when we're shooting outside a vigil or a sanctuary, there's always particles sticking to the lens, even with a filter on which show up on the video. This is preventing me from doing long takes. Are there any hacks to minimize this? A little technical question from another uh photographer. Bobby, I'll let you answer that one if you have a quick answer for that. Uh, 
Uh, well, I, I sent her a private message. There's there's a number of uh, answers. Some are expensive, some are not. There's some you know, like you could put you could do an anti-static treatment on a filter. Um, you could also just use like a a longer lens to where like if you're shooting with like a, a 120 or an 85, if something hits the lens, it's going to be essentially so out of focus that it, it, it might blur the image a little bit, but not, not much. Other than that, you're gonna look at like matte boxes with spinning filters on them that, you know, like they'll use if there's water in a shot, that way the water gets thrown right off the, uh, the, the lens, um, which is an expensive setup. Um, but yeah, that, and sometimes, you know what, don't worry about it. Sometimes just keep filming. Uh, if, my uh, one of my professors in college for when I switched to environmental filmmaking, he was a producer with National Geographic and he won a bunch of Emmys. And he was saying, You need to get the shot first, right? Especially in, in, when it comes to like filming, uh, like photojournalism or filming wildlife and things like that, where they could just what you want could be gone immediately. You need to get the shot first, and then after you have it, do your artistic shot, but get it first. Excellent, awesome. Priya, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> so I have um, very little experience with, with filmmaking. I studied it in college in the late 80s and um, early 90s and worked with Pittsburgh filmmakers and we created video production. I did black and white photography and so forth. And I have an iPhone 12 Pro. <laughs> um, I have a concept and an idea, and I'm just kind of trying to figure out like what what to do next. Um, and so my um, and and I have a writing background. I've I've written, not successfully, and so that's a side thing too. So the concept is um, that I'm I'm from India, and um, you know I've I've had my eyes opened by a fellow vegan around the lies around dairy in India, you know, like what actually happens to cows. And I researched it and found, you know, the atrocious articles. Um, and so that's something that I've become interested in. And I, you know, came up with the name like opening eyes because that's how it felt for me. Uh, because I feel like I've been raised on lies and it was eye opening to sort of, um, you know, learn about uh, the deception I feel like I was <laughs> raised under. And I, and I would love to create something that um, speaks to that. And I'm planning on going to India in December and I've been trying to make connections online. I'm in like um, some groups like India Vegan, Rev Vegan Revolution. And I'm, so I'm trying to join all these groups, PETA India and so forth. Um, and so that's become my interest and my passion is to try to shed light on that. But I'm also aware, like, I have no idea where to begin technically, you know, so that feels intimidating. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering how that all sounds to you, <laughs> whether I should just stick to maybe trying to write, uh, forget trying to do anything technical with it, or um, whether I should try to make an attempt when I go in December. Should I even try to get some footage? Well, of course you should try, in my humble opinion. Um, follow your dreams, listen to that inspiration, and then figure out a way to do it. I mean, look, uh, I don't know what example to use. Facebook, maybe Mark Zuckerberg, you know. He just was a guy at Harvard, you know. I mean... He had a buddy, Eduardo, who had this algorithm and they started with their little face mash, you know, which was derogatory and so forth. Um, for those of you who've seen the social network, you know the whole story, but they figured it out and they started things. And that's the same thing with, um, with any concept that becomes a product or an innovation. It's an idea, vision into form, vision into form. So, so, um, and again, opening eyes, this, is, this vision came to you. It didn't come to anybody else. So you have to pursue it the best you can. Just don't get in your own way, which I've done a hundred times, made loads of mistakes, but 
you know, be practical with it. And if there's a, if there's a wall, again, the classic expression, necessity is a mother of invention, right? So if you have limitations for some reason, don't turn away from them, look square at them and say, okay, how do I get around this and achieve the same effect? Um, but I would strongly encourage you not to just give up and go back to only writing. You can always write. But if you have an idea for this and you're going to go to India and the iPhone 12 is fine, by the way, the iPhone 6 was fine. So, uh, um, you know, it, 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 they're great. Um, but yeah, shoot something, document what you document, what you're there, come bring it home and look at it, learn from it and see again. I always say it can have a, have a positive effect on somebody else. Thank you. I think uh, Yude had a question a while ago. Um, I don't know. Okay. Still here. No. Let's jump in. Hey, there he is. Yeah, I really enjoyed uh, like the, the presentation and like really appreciate like uh, both of you from the video and the the uh, photo side. So I've learned a lot, but like. Like my question is that I'll start, I've been making music for like four years. I make beats and I've actually like sampled Moby a few times. Funny enough, so I was wondering like I was like thinking of getting into the into the, the film industry and like like pitching my music to be working with like films and if, if possible animal rights movies. So I was wondering some advice on how to do that. Uh, well, again, I mean you, your voice is only your own, so whatever music you're writing is coming to you is uniquely yours. Uh, uh, well, one thought that just came to me now as you were asking your question was, um, you know, they say fake it till you make it. And people say fake it till you make it. It's expression. It's about confidence. So it's just talking about confidence. Um, we have to exude confidence. We have to believe in what we're talking about because um, belief is infectious. It really is. It's very infectious when you walk up to somebody and you, you look them in the eye and you believe in something. I, I heard an interview with um, Robert Downey Jr. And when he, when he first got the Iron Man role. And this is an actor who had a big career in the 80s and 90s and then he, he, his star fell and he went through a whole problem and he came back. And they asked him, they said, how did you know how to play this billionaire, this, this Tony Stark character? How did you know how to do this? And he goes, I don't know. I didn't know any billionaires. I didn't know anybody like this. Um, I just had a vision of what I thought a broken guy with a lot of money trying to overcompensate would be like. And the guy said, well, what was that vision? And he said, I pictured wherever Tony Stark went, there was a caravan of Rolls Royces behind him, just a caravan of Rolls Royces. And he says, and that thought gave me an attitude. And I went into my auditions with that attitude and it came off, it came off on, on screen. So all of you have to envision that a caravan of Rolls Royces is right behind you with vegan leather inside, of course, and um, believe in yourselves 100%, super confident, not to the point of being cocky, but infectious belief in what you're doing. Because again, only each of you have this particular idea that's coming to you, and it's coming from someplace, the void, the divine, I don't know but it's a dream, but it's worth listening to. And maybe it's coming to you for a very strong reason because the world needs it. Only you can do it. So dude, uh, with your music, man, just um, just don't give up. Just, just you got a caravan of Rolls Royces behind you with your music, okay? I hope that helps. I don't know if this is helping. I hope it helps. I don't know if people like, I wrote the notes down, like it's really in inspiring stuff. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Dave. So I'm gonna to go to the vegan sheepdog next and then I'm gonna go back to the chat. Yep. And unmute. First off, thank you both for all that you guys do. I appreciate you guys. Um, you talked about some things, talk about Trojan horse activism, um, talk about, you know, I think you said something that's really important about making something other people wanna see. Um, you know, if we just show a violent, image of an animal being slaughtered you know social media is going to kick that off no one's going to watch it no one's going to see it because even as vegans we don't want to see it and then sean i always appreciate your quote that we shouldn't um you know hide with our eyes what the animals go through um but how do how do we tie this together as far as 
making sure we get that message. And you're absolutely right, Sean, your point, like we've been saying the same thing for 40 years. How do we change that messaging? How do we package that up so people want to see it and want to hear it? Like any advice from an activism standpoint, um, how to kind of wrap that up in a pretty bow so it's palatable for everyone, but yet holding to the truth of what's going on so people understand what they're supporting. Okay, well, I had a chance to interview you once before, as I recall, somewhere in Canada, I think we did it. Maybe it was in Toronto. I can't remember. Or Montreal. I forget where we were. Chicago. Am I right? Oh, Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, other side of the big pond. But um, <laughs> um, you have a very interesting voice that's uniquely yours. Again, each, as each of you do, I probably can't belabor this point enough. Um, but when we're when an idea comes to us and we know the truth, we know the statistics, we know the horror, we have to find that way to make it interesting to the person we're talking to. Because you can see in a conversation with somebody if their eyes are starting to drift and you're just talking about, maybe you're talking about another subject, maybe you're talking about politics or the news or something. You can read a person really easily. Um, you just have to think of your voice and then what is a unique way of doing it? It's not really what you're trying to say because you already know what you're going to say. It's how to say it so that others will listen to you. That's the question each of us need to be asking. So for example, uh, another friend of mine, Ethan Brown, he's the CEO of Beyond Me. Okay, so I've known Ethan for many years. The origins of Beyond Me, quick story, this applies to you, applies to everybody, was Ethan wondered, how come if you buy a frozen chicken and you rip off the cellophane and smell it, it stinks? Not only that, if you stick a frozen chicken in the microwave and heat it up, it's not going to taste good to eat. It's a disgusting thing. But put it on a barbecue and something is triggered in people's minds. And Ethan wondered, can I do that with plants? Like does, if a chicken or a frozen piece of meat is disgusting right out of the package, but you put it on a barbecue and something happens, can I do that biologically manipulating plants? And that was the origin of Beyond Meat. That's how it started. He figured it out. And in his way, a lot of animals have had not to die because of a product that he's created. I say that because each of you, I swear to, I swear to whatever you swear to that's holy and a little scary to swear to because it might be true. Um, that's how confident I am when I'm going to tell you. I swear that each of you have this unique voice that is 100% only yours and you just have to figure out this little way to adjust it to see if you can reach people with it. Remember back in the 70s, for those of you who are that old, they sold the pet rock. It's a pretty big seller, by the way. Shows you how gullible the public can be. Pat Rock. <laughs> Bit of a marketing spin. Why aren't we figuring out our marketing spin? We're going to yell at people all day long and hold our sign and honk, make them honk. I mean, what is this doing? Like, we have to just, just think for a minute. Is it true that was it Alexander Graham Bell, I forget, whoever made the light bulb that he tried like 4,000 times and he was about to throw in the towel, but that final time was just a half turn of a screw and the light bulb turned on? I mean, that's how close he was. He was so close at the end and he's just about to give up, but it was just this little tiny tweak and there was light, which is a metaphor for truth for us. So to you, man, whatever it is that you're feeling, just go deep within and figure out this way of saying exactly what you want to say, but it might be subtext instead of direct. It might be what's not said and you might even reach more people doing it uh if i could just add to this um i think that we've we have to be willing to do a little more work uh, i think when we when we decide we're going to go out with signs and and chants and things that's essentially an arm putting on a uniform without training or or a team putting on a uniform without practice expecting to hit the field and win right we have to do the the work ahead of time to understand our audience uh, we have to do some soul searching and say, you know, but for the flip of a coin, everyone I talk to could be me, you know, and, and realize I can't just hold up a sign that's generic 
right? And we have to be willing to say, I'm willing to understand you. That doesn't mean I agree with you, but I'm willing to do the work to understand you because ridicule or just grabbing a sign requires nothing of us in terms of preparation, right? It, we're, just, we're going out there without a battle plan. You know, we, we, have, we know nothing about who we're, we're going up against because we're just putting on our uniforms and going and hoping that, I don't know, somehow we're gonna win. And I, like, we have to be willing to do the hard work. We have to be willing to, you know, do, do all the, the practice, you know, like you wrestled, right? You, you, you didn't just put on your wrestling uniform and go out there and hope you were gonna win, you know? I think, I think we need to take more of that approach. Great, great question, great answers. So let's go to a few more questions in the chat. Uh, Julius asks, does, do producers who create animal rights and other key documentaries factor in film screening for community groups to show, or it is, is it rarely considered when trying to get it distributed? I need to make sure I understand that question. Uh, does producers who create animal rights and other key documentaries factor in film screening for community groups to show it, or is it rarely considered when trying to get it distributed? Can you elaborate on that question just a little further? Julius, are you there? Do you want to unmute and elaborate? We could come back to it too. Uh, she's, a... the, the mic isn't working. Uh, I think what they're saying is like, is that a way to help? create or, or to get distribution if we do screenings to like animal rights communities or at like, you know, animal rights events. Uh, I kind of, I, I, I kind of answered the question uh, in the chat uh, as a direct message that it really depends on each individual film and the situation, because a lot of the times, if you put it out there at festivals and distribution are going to say, well, we don't want everyone seeing it before we find a platform, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and a lot of the times the screenings are private screenings for people who they think might be interested in helping them get distribution. It's, you know, there's not, you don't make, there's not much ROI in, in documentaries, but we, we, we do like to make our money back. Um, and so when, when you put it out for free before you start making any money on it, uh, distributors are gonna walk away. Yeah. yeah. Great. And Tamara has a question in the chat. I'm beginning with short videos that I post on social media. Uh, posts with video draw more people. Uh, what video libraries have the greatest number of copyright free clips? Mm -hmm. uh, there's several out there. You just got to do a bit of a search. There's a group called Pond5 that's pretty good that gives you some stuff, but most of the time you may have to pay for a little bit of it. Um, we, we licensed a lot of footage for Unity. We licensed a ton, including Getty and the BBC. Um, they're tricky. Um, in Unity, we have a shot of, <laughs> okay, so here's a producer story for you. In Unity, we have a shot at one point in the middle of a montage of Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Jr. So I wanted a clip of Martin Luther King. Getting images had the footage that I wanted to use. And so, uh, however, their criteria was that um, it was $100 a second. It's $100 a second. So, now that was okay because um, my average cutting ratio was about 2.5 seconds. So for instance, if I brought up a picture of Martin Luther King, 1001, 1002, 1000, you got it. You got it in two and a half seconds. So the catch was with Getty is that you had to have a minimum of a 20 second license. So um, you pay two grand for a shot that you're only gonna use for two and a half seconds. Um, when you're making your movie, uh, these are uh, financial producing questions that will uh, come your way and then you have to decide if the two and a half second shot is worth it or not um, so uh, it depends on what you're trying to put together and the impact you're having uh, in my case uh, I definitely wanted to show this civil rights leader this African-American and I paid two thousand dollars for two and a half seconds however in other shots throughout the movie I didn't have to pay anywhere close to that I paid, I got it either for free or for a fraction of the cost. So ultimately it all kind of balanced out, but it happened to be one of those more expensive clips. Um, whenever I hear the Rolling Stones or Frank Sinatra in a commercial for Gatorade or whatever, that's music licensing. Uh, those are six figure songs. Those are six figure songs. You're, you're looking at four or 500 grand to license a track like that. Um, 
So those big companies like T-Mobile or whatever, Super Bowl ads, they pay it, they pay for it. My, um, my ex-wife, I was married once and we had a daughter. Uh, she's a commercial um, producer. She does commercials she has for almost 30 years and she did two Super Bowl spots this last year. T-Mobile. Um, the budget was $2 million for a 30 second spot. I wish I had $2 million to make a movie. Can you imagine having $2 million for 30 seconds? But the airtime was seven. So they spent $9 million for a 30 second spot. That's just the advertising business in the Super Bowl. That's just how it is. An insane amount of money. And you as messenger filmmakers are up against this level of content, high quality, mass distributed content, which is again, why you have to dig deep and find a unique inner voice that no budget can compensate for. And that is, is absolutely magnetizing. You can't take your eyes off it. That little combination is what we're searching for in each of you. Sorry to keep belaboring that point, but I really feel strong about it. Anyway, let's move on to the next one. Well, I just, I want to see that movie Ambulance because Sean always talks about like, if I could just get like a fraction of the budget. That he's <laughs> yeah. And because uh, a friend of a friend who I was seeing it with like is in the movie. So I went uh -huh. to see and Michael okay, Bay cool. movies are usually bad. But they're usually bad in an entertaining way. This is one of the worst, and, ones, this is one of the worst ones I've ever seen. Ambulance. But um, but I haven't seen it. But he's visually stunning as a filmmaker. I mean, his foot yeah, is this spectacular. Not, man. This one is just oh, like, it isn't. It's just I don't know what happened with this one, but it's it's just awful. And yeah, uh, but he, I think I think he. No, made I'm just it thinking like you know tens of millions of dollars on his budget. Mm -hmm. The budget on a Michael Bay film is just extraordinary, and he like yeah. put this garbage out. You know, I'm like, I'm like, I'm sitting there like, if Sean were here right now, he'd be like, look at what they did with all this money. They did nothing, they just threw it away. <laughs> you know? but, and then the trick with that is, is that, uh, cause we don't want to be all, all bitter. So we have to, we, we don't want to sink into a point of, oh, they get this, and we don't get that. And they get this, because that's just a waste of time and energy. So um, just look at it as well. The potential's there, the money is there. If I can find a way to tell my story in a way that it reaches more people. I'm telling you, if we could see the activists 10, 20, 30 years from now, they're going to be doing this. This will be normal. This will be how they're getting their stuff out there. Uh, they'll find a less didactic, lecturing way of conveying it, and it'll it could potentially have a broader effect. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on. So, yeah. um, Jeremy the Ape, you're next. Get him on mute. Thank you all for um, bringing us together to connect and share ideas tonight. Um, I guess my question is kind of around how to navigate the trap of um, treatment versus use. And you know, the more classically referred to as kind of animal welfare versus animal rights. And specifically, you know, how, how can we avoid if we're focusing on, you know, the, the common language of the abuse, cruelty and suffering um, in, in, in conditions, how can we avoid sending the message that it's simply about improving the conditions and actually ending the use altogether? And more specifically, getting people to really connect with the individual on a level that any level of breeding, use, and murder would be just considered completely and morally unacceptable, as it is probably to everyone here. But you know, how mm -hmm. do we connect that message, not just put in crudely, like how not just focus on the negative, but also focus on their positive individuality? Um, and yeah, maybe how we can apply that to our own filmmaking and, and maybe the role sanctuaries can play in all this. I know there's a lot in there, but. <laughs> uh, the, the, the one possibility could be to reverse engineer it. So you're two, you kind of had two questions, you know, one on, you know, they're improving conditions as a sort of way of saying, hey, we're doing better. But on the other hand, we're trying to say, look, these guys are individual. I start with the individual aspect first, and then you can work backwards because once they recognize their individuals, and of course, anything like, well, let's, let's give them a little more, a couple more inches seems, you know, this is, uh, seems sort of pointless. I've told this story once before too, but just very quickly when on earth things, we were at a dairy farm and there was a, there was one, it's not in the movie, but there was an incident where this mother cow was trying, they were taking the calf away from the mother. You know, she got her one day with her mom, drank her colostrum so that she was strong enough. And then they were separating and they brought in the sort of divider to separate. And that mother was pressing against that divider to get to her calf, like any mother would do. And she pressed up against it so hard, she broke her neck. She broke her neck trying to get to her daughter. 
and um, they still took the calf away. And um, what was really shocking about it was this mother cow who'd had, this wasn't her first baby, it was probably her seventh or eighth or ninth that had been taken away and she's there with his broken neck hanging down and clearly anybody looking at this scene Anybody with, as I say, with cerebral function watching this could see that this is an animal that's grieving. This is an animal showing grief, hopelessness. Um, it was palpable. You could, you could see it just like a scared dog. You could read the emotion. But the most profound thing was when the other cows came around and tried to bolster her up, tried to lift her spirits. It's just astounding. Now, that story took me 30 seconds or 40 seconds to tell you. Even maybe the most hardened person listening to a moment like that might consider dairy a little bit different after that story before I ever talk about space or being individual. This is why the power of the story, the narrative, maybe over the doc, maybe the narrative over documentary could be a backdoor way to crowbar ourselves in there and get them to think about it a little differently because again they come by quite honestly they've been inundated with this messaging since they were kids just like we all were they have been inundated and inundated and inundated i mean here let's do some simple math i'll get my phone out you get my calculator let's say you're talking to a person who's 50 years old let's say they're 40 years old and they've been eating meat for 38 of those years or 39 of those years. So let's say they've had an animal products once a day. So 365 days a year times 39 years. So they've had 14,235 incidents and that's just once a day of eating animals. Now you're coming along with your encounter with them and you're having your little one minute or two minute or three minute conversation. Your one encounter is up against 14,235 other previous encounters. And that's just in terms of eating. There might be political beliefs. There might be religious beliefs with what they're eating. There might be something that great, great, great grandmother made and handed down over and over and over. That's why I always say start with compassion first. Try to reach them with compassion first as opposed to yelling and screaming. Try to reason with them and try to find a way to get in there and plant a little seed that can go up against those 14,000 impressions that they already have stacked against you. You may never see this person again in this lifetime. You are intersecting for a few moments in time. As I said at the beginning, whatever you do, I implore you, make sure you had a positive effect, not a negative one. Make sure you had a positive effect in that intersection. Not a crazy vegan, because otherwise, you're cementing something else that they already have. And we as a movement have had a terrible time with that. The only reason why we're called crazy vegans is because people think we're actually crazy. This is a self-fulfilling prophecy. We have not learned to communicate as effective as we could. And people think we're nuts. Even the plant-based uh, physicians don't call themselves vegan or animal rights activists. They just say they're plant-based. Or they say, Bobby, you know, they use other terms because they don't want to associate with the animal rights movement. Okay, I don't blame animal rights activists for passionate. We don't know how else to say it. We're angry. We see footage. We're emotional. We're reacting to it. The light just turned on. We're born again, so to speak. But remember, that encounter, that intersection that each of us are having could happen tonight. We could have one today or tomorrow. It's, it's a precious few moments where you're running into somebody. So, you know, I always tell people that we're gardeners. All of us are gardeners casting seeds every day. And sometimes those seeds fall on stony ground. Sometimes they fall on rich soil, but we have to keep planting our seeds. Yeah. Thank you. Hope that helps. Sure. All right. Yeah. So we have a little more time so we can have a, a few more questions, a couple more, a few more. Um, and in the chat, Tamir is asking, uh, what advice would you give to someone who's trying to capture the same type of imagery as earthlings? And what do you think activists could do with ad gag laws being on the rise? Um, Sean, remember we were in Arkansas and I, we were filming chickens and I said, what if we go in there and the employees are just 
they've got like guns out and they're shooting chickens and we film it and we get caught. Do we go to jail? They're like, yeah, we do. Yeah. I mean, the expression, again, the picture's worth a thousand words, right? So um, careful with the imagery with the other things because as, as it's been brought up before, you know, at the time it was kind of maybe we hadn't seen it, but now anybody can look online and see this kind of footage. So um, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. Go ahead, do it if you like, but uh, be mindful of that um, if people are going to watch it. Um, in terms of ad gag laws, yeah. Um, um, you're an activist. Um, you're Robin Hood's with a camera. You know, you may have to steal images and give them to the poor, so to speak. The poor well, of mine. Like, be prepared. Like, if you think that there's a chance that you could get caught and charged with some sort of ag gag law and go to jail, like, be pre like, make sure that if you if you can't get help, that you can get out. Like, if you need bail money make sure you have that you know well yeah be i mean be be smart about it are yeah. you driving around are you driving around with no gas in your tank or you don't have insurance or you have a flat tire and there's a couple of just basic uh you know things that if you if you go that route i hope that helps nice andrea you have a question you can unmute hi um just first want to say thank you guys so much uh for you know all the inspiring uh, t uh, words and advice, um, I my question is around uh, kind of okay. Say I you know got my film. I've got a which I, I don't fully have the film yet, but um, uh, if I have the sixty second reel and you know I'm ready to distribute, what is your advice on the best way to find a distributor? Because I, I know for a book, if I'm going to publish a book, I'm reaching out to publishers, right? But for a film, how do I find a distributor? What would your advice be um, in terms of um, getting it out there if I'm not supposed to be, you know, like putting it out there for free? Um, what's the kind of steps for that? Um, you have a, what, what's, you have a, a whole project, you said, but you have a 60 second teaser for it is that uh, did I, hear I don't that right? have it all done yet but i'm 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 i know how to get that part done it's just that that last piece of how to get it distributed right um hmm. there are several distributors out there that you should look at smaller ones don't go to the big ones but um and there's probably a contact you can find online and you send them an email. Again, squeaky wheel gets the grease and say, hey, I have something. This is the project. I have one minute. Will you look at it? And uh, I think the classic salesman statistic is nine no's for every yes. So for every 10, you're looking at, you know, 1% type thing. So don't be dismayed by um, that. Just you can go through. But I pick uh, smaller distributors. Uh, there's a great service called IMDB, um, stands for the Internet Movie Database. It's a great one. I pay for the pro version, which isn't really that much because it gives you more access to more details. And um, you can find contact info for just about anybody. And you'd be astounded. LinkedIn, too, is shockingly has a way to get right to people. It's sort of their version of direct messaging. And you send them, say, hey, I've got this one thing. It's, it's a minute. And don't be surprised if they don't answer. Just keep, you do a follow-up, do two or three, and then leave, let it go. And and uh, lightning might strike. Yeah, that's all. Don't believe in what you're doing. Believe in whatever got you this far. Don't you doubt for one second. Don't let a single doubt come in. You just believe in what you're doing, and you walk in that room with absolute confidence, or that email or whatever. And when you talk them on the phone, be clear, concise, short, to the point. And you literally got to make them feel like they're going to miss out on something if they don't do this. And even then, it might be nine out of ten say no. But you will you will find a home for it somewhere. Yes, yeah, so just push on. You're you're already so far. Look how far down the road you are. You got the movie; it's almost done. You got you've already achieved so much. So, uh, knock on some doors. You know, something might open. Thank you. Just, just remember, Stranger Things was rejected by like thirty different uh, production companies and, and distributors before it found Netflix. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, there's lots of stories like that. Yeah. Big shows. Everyone needs an Alec Peterson, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, y'all need someone that just goes out there and hustles a little bit for you and shakes hands. I believe in collaborations and partnerships. Um, I'm not very good at uh, uh, pitching and stuff. So I have a partner that I work with, Alec, who I met. We have known him for many years. And Alex great at like meeting people put people together and even then you know we strike out a lot of the times but it's just great networking relationship building stuff yeah okay so we are going to start to wrap start to wrap up so i just i think i have one final question though with um for sean you know with all the horror the horrors that you have seen firsthand what do you personally do to avoid and manage you know burnout and compassion fatigue and secondary uh, trauma yeah i'm sure everybody good. here can use some of those tips good question really good question strong question they're all good questions but that's a great one uh, um try to remember that you are a filter and not take it so personally that your voice is to filter so all this crappy water's coming in and you're the filter, you're like a liver. And then you're gonna deliver a clear message to people. But if you start identifying with all the crap coming into the liver, you're not recognizing the functionality of this piece of equipment and what its, what its job is. You're sort of imbuing the suffering on yourself and then you're, you're shrinking from it. So um, filter it, filter it and share it with other people in the most positive, effective, thoughtful way to make them think about it. Because again, people come by this honestly. I grew up eating animals. I'm guessing every single person here, unless there's some young people, probably grew up eating animals, right? I mean, I got two kids, they're both vegan. Pure vegan, born and raised vegan, but I wasn't. I had animals for 26 years. Um, I didn't know any different. It's a tribute to the effectiveness of the marketing of the meat and dairy industry, truth be told. When I was a kid watching McDonald's commercials, there were all those characters. And I wasn't just the clown. There was the shake guy that was, I think, a tree. The tree was like a shake, a milkshake. There was the hamburglar, some thief that stole hamburgers. He, he wore like prison clothes with stripes on. Them. These are all these characters. And back then, you can watch this on YouTube. Hamburgers at McDonald's were grown in a hamburger patch. It was a garden of hamburgers. I'm a little kid going, oh, it's a garden. No one told me that was a cow. And talk about effective, crazy, psycho marketing. So remember, people come by it honestly. They've been raised a certain way. So, so you're performing inception on people like the DiCaprio movie. You're planting a seed that has been built up those 14,000 meals or more. And the inspiration will come to you. And it already has because you're already on a trajectory, all of you, from whatever you've written, music, words, books, films. You're already on this trajectory. You've already been following it. It's already been happening. It's nonlinear. You're already doing it. You're just coming. You're just getting ready to birth it. That's all. You're all in your third trimester is what I'm telling you. And you're about to give birth. So uh, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just get it out there and see what happens. Um, anyway, I hope this was uh, helpful. Thank you, Sean. Bobby, you have something to add to, to yeah. that? And, and I talked about I talk about this a lot because I think it's it's important to me. I think it's important. Um, motivation is important, uh, and what you're motivated by. Um, most activists are motivated by either love or hate. Uh, they're doing it because they hate animal agriculture. They hate slaughterhouse workers and slaughterhouses and that people are hurting animals and that they're destroying the planet and they're destroying their health, uh, which I understand and hate's a great motivator for short-term change. There's no denying that. Um, but if that's your motivation then every action you take is gonna be a reminder of how much hate you have, how much you hate this, how much you hate that. Um, and I gotta tell you, it's exhausting, but if you make your motivation about love, like how much you love helping animals, how much you love rescuing them and, and saving the planet and helping people find their health and become connected to the world again. And every action is an affirmation of how much love you have. And when it's difficult, like my first day working with Sean was like trial by fire. We were inside 
a beef slaughterhouse and mm-hmm. there were like cow heads on these racks and the organs and their throats were still moving uh and we were they, were, they had to pull down hooks and they're pulling you know the, the hides off of them and we come out with these white like you know like doctor robes or whatever and they were just blood red all of them and i told bobby I, that day by the way I, if i could just jump in for a second yeah. i told bobby because it was his first day it was his first day working with me and we went to a slaughterhouse we had access to go on site and i said to him i don't know if you remember this bobby i said dude you've got to be poker faced when you go I in know. here this is going to be very difficult very difficult you're going to see things and smell things you're going to get wet um but you have to be poker faced because if you are reacting it meant it's going to it's you as the filmmaker are going to infuse what you're documenting it's going to affect we aren't here we can't stop this um because there's a demand there's a constant demand for this so but but be poker faced and document it because that's where the that's where the power can come for all the animals yet unborn yeah and as we were it's walking, very difficult we get, don't poker face probably like snapping yeah I'd, I'd snap at him because he's naturally like anybody would be just like oh, i mean it's just it's just it's like walking through the you know house of horrors obviously you know it's unbelievable but, i mean on that day i could have sat there uh and filming a cow being killed fuming with hate like fuming mm, yeah. with the, like the desire to go and like tackle the person with the 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 captive bolt gun what good would that do right uh you know fuming with the idea that like, I'm physically able to, to rescue this, this cow, but in reality, even if I'm physically able, it wasn't gonna happen, right? But instead I sat there saying, I can handle this because I have this much love for them. I, I can do this because I, I have this much love for what I'm doing and the animals that I'm rescuing. And I think that that is empowering even in those difficult situations versus hate, which, I mean, hate just eats you up inside. and. I'm not like, I could be wrong. I've just never seen evidence of hate creating lasting positive change. I don't think we're ever going to hate enough to create a kind of world. That doesn't make sense to me. I think that if we, we, we change our mindset to being motivated by what, saving what we love instead of fighting what we hate, essentially. Yeah, great way to, yeah, thank you so much. A love-based approach, that's a great note to, to end on. Um, if anybody has, or Bobby or Sean, any resources you wanna put into the chat, you're, you're welcome to do that. Or if anybody wants to share their Instagram handles in the chat, you're welcome to do that. I know there's probably still more questions. Um, we may be able to answer in the chat as we're wrapping up, but... Um, before we go, I'm going to make a few more announcements. I have to jump off, but I just want to thank everybody. Thank you all for having me. And I hope, again, I hope it was useful and has a positive effect. And I look forward to seeing what you all have to bring to the world. Thank Thanks. you, Sean. Big hand for right. Sean. Big hand. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. So everybody else, hold on for just a month, another minute or two. I just want to announce some upcoming workshops. We really appreciate your being here tonight and participating. AAM is um, offering uh, regular workshops on, on Monday, this Monday, June 6th. We have our security culture of staying safe as an activist. Very important workshop on July 9th is our vegan hospitality workshop. And there's more to be announced. A couple of large in-person event announcements Activists at all levels can, can come uh, to where we're converging and participate uh, in the Chicago Convergence. It's a 10 day animal rights activism event that will largely be focused on taking action against the fur industry, but will also include other actions as well. And the dates are July 29th through August 7th. Um, and the AAM Ohio Occurrence is a three day animal rights activism event in Cleveland. Uh, this event will feature several different types of animal rights activism. The dates are September 2nd through the 4th. And to find details on all of this, you can reach out to myself. You can go through our website. You can check out our uh, Facebook page, um, our Instagram, et cetera. Um, so thank you all for being here. Thank you once again to Sean and to Bobby for your time and wisdom. Um, 
Thank you for all the work you are each of you doing in the world for the animals of the, of the world. And if you're interested in becoming a mentor or a mentee or want to get involved with AAM, please reach out to us. And in the meantime, we'll add you to our email newsletter list as well. All right, so until, until next time, everybody stay strong and live vegan. Thank you, everybody.